Hi everybody, this is Jamie and I would like to welcome you to my Facebook livecast, which I will be streaming later on several of my professional pages and groups since I know a lot of you can't be here at the six o'clock hour. Uh, this is a chance for me to talk to you a little bit about my newest release, Process Not Perfection, Expressive Arts Solutions and Trauma Recovery and get your questions for those of you who may be joining us live. So this book is, I mean, I know for those of us who've written multiple books, it can feel like we don't have any favorites, but for many, many reasons, this book is certainly my favorite. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you a screenshot of it right now, Process Not Perfection, Expressive Arts Solutions and Trauma Recovery. And one of the reasons that it certainly is one of my favorites is because so many members of our community, the dancing mindfulness community, the expressive arts community that uh, surrounds my work in the Institute for Creative Mindfulness went into making contributions and suggestions and giving me feedback on making this book. So before I go further, and I know while we may still be waiting for some people to join us, I just want to send my best wishes, good energy, good vibes, good prayers for people in Paris tonight. Uh, I had an amazing experience at um, the Cathedral de Notre Dame in 2005 when I was there and I was just looking back on my journal of that experience and <sighs> was very moved by the architecture, the art, the history and um, yeah. I, it's just one of those times I don't really have words for what's happening right now other than sending good wishes and vibes and prayers and healing energy to, to people that are involved. So at any time during this live cast, if you want to submit a question, if you want to submit a comment, I would be certainly happy to entertain it here on the live cast and maybe some of the questions that you ask live can be worthwhile for those who will be watching this later. So, uh, Process Not Perfection, Expressive Art Solutions and Trauma Recovery is my seventh book. Uh, I started writing books in 2011. My first book was an EMDR book, and then from there I went into writing Trauma and the 12 Steps. And my next two books went more into the vibe of working with mindfulness and creativity, uh, with creative mindfulness. Uh, then I went back to trauma, uh, working with Trauma Made Simple, and then of course with... Um, Dancing mindfulness uh, was really when the movement around dancing mindfulness kind of took a thrust forward in uh, what had started as a class becoming more of a practice and a way of life. And when the Dancing Mindfulness book was written in 2015, as I was preparing it, a challenge that my editor made on that one was, can you write this as a book that speaks more to the general public as opposed to a clinical audience teaching them how they can essentially build a practice, how they can build a personal practice in dancing mindfulness. And so I really liked that book. And then after Dancing Mindfulness, I wrote a few more professional pieces for more of a clinical audience. But I loved how the Dancing Mindfulness book was able to have an impact on the general public and not just clinicians. Yet it was also a book that clinicians would be able to read and use and uh, implement in their clinical settings, or particularly if they found themselves working with the concepts in the book for themselves in their own personal practice. So that is a lot of the spirit that came into making Process Not Perfection, that I wanted to write a book, again, that was something that more the general public can consume if they want to learn how to build and work with an expressive arts practice, yet also be a book that clinicians can take and hopefully work for themselves. Because I do find that the key to not just being a good expressive arts therapist, but working with expressive arts concepts in clinical settings is that you have done these practices yourself. That even though we've created a very robust handbook here of expressive arts practices, it's not just like you're going to run it off as a copy and give it to your clients or just read the instructions out of the handbook that we really want you to have had an experience first with working these expressive arts processes and practices in your life and then from this experience of having hopefully a transformative experience in expressive arts hopefully having this ability to work through challenges that may come up that from that very organic place you're able to share your practice with your clients because in all of my work whether it be with trauma-informed yoga whether it be with dancing mindfulness whether it be with expressive arts practice I continue to teach that the best 
therapists, the best teachers are simply people who share their practice. And from that place of having a personal practice, clients are naturally going to be more inspired if you're sharing something that is very much organic to you. So part of the evolution of this book and is re to really talk about the evolution of the dancing mindfulness practice. Because uh, in 2014, 12 is when the dancing mindfulness practice is some, um, and, and I always say with dancing mindfulness, it's nothing I invented because dance and mindfulness are two of the oldest practices on the planet. What I've simply done, I believe, in the dancing mindfulness practice is bring the community and a system for practicing it together in a way that is ultimately trauma informed and accessible. Uh, one of my huge driving beliefs is that any human activity can be practiced mindfully. Any human activity can be used as a vehicle to meditation and to higher states of consciousness. And that's what we've done with dancing mindfulness from the beginning. Yet because I'm a multi-art person, having been a musician and dabbled in theater and obviously being a writer, dancing mindfulness was never just about dance which is why I was delighted to learn that so many people from the expressive arts community ended up embracing dancing mindfulness. And uh, one of the amazing stories that I like to share about that um, gives tribute to somebody I cite and honor very robustly in this new book, and that's Christine Paintner, who I consider to be uh, my main expressive arts teacher and mentor. So uh, Dr. Christine approached me in the summer of 2014 after she had learned about dancing mindfulness. And uh, she's based in Galway now, an American uh, living and working in Galway, uh, a multinational fantastic reach of her ministry, Abbey of the Arts. And even when I first saw that email, Abbey of the Arts, I said, this is just fantastic. And she asked to be trained in dancing mindfulness. And I took her through the distance training. But at that point, I realized that she herself had written six or seven books, primarily from a Christian perspective, but working with expressive arts and a lot of progressive themes that I really, really like. So I ended up going on a retreat with her the following year. And at that time, also diving more deeply into specific professional expressive arts therapy, as is kind of governed by IATA, the International Expressive Arts Therapy Association. And in expressive arts therapy, I found a home. Because because a lot of you know my story that I never really resonated with the field of dance movement therapy. And that's with due respect to what the field of dance movement therapy offers. But I now know why I never really resonated with that field was I wanted more of a multimodal experience, even though I am uh, very much a dancer. I am equally so a writer and I'm equally so a, a musician and a performer. And I've even come to embrace my visual talents and my visual uh capacity to create art, which I had long viewed as my weak link through being able to study the expressive arts specifically with Christine's work. So having gone on a couple courses with Christine, working through all of her books and deepening my own ex specific expressive arts therapy practice, I really started moving the dancing mindfulness community more in that direction and aligning dancing mindfulness, not just as a trauma informed modality, but specifically as a um, expressive arts therapy path. Uh, and it, even now I refer to dancing mindfulness as the dancing mindfulness approach to expressive arts therapy, because in the uh, dancing mindfulness book in 2015, I did start to go into other expressive and creative modalities that you could bring into the dancing mindfulness practices, but our community uh, really took to that. And even our retreats that happen every April, we're getting ready for our next one here in the next uh 10 days to two weeks, it's happening. Yeah, we're within two weeks. Um, we've just really been playing with a lot more of the art forms and realized that they're just all gateways to practicing mindfulness and conscious living in this more trauma-informed way. So in 2017, this was after I got grandfathered in, I officially got my credential as a registered expressive arts therapist. I decided I wanted to train dancing mindfulness more from this perspective of expressive arts therapy. And in 2017, I did my first um, intro to expressive arts therapy course, which was largely attended by people in the dancing mindfulness community. It debuted on the retreat. And it was one of the most beautiful professional experiences of my life because I really felt everything that I believed about trauma recovery and trauma healing and the impact of dance and action-based intervention just really kind of comes together in what I call in the book, this buffet of expressive practices. And that 
I think for those of you who've never really heard the term expressive arts or expressive arts therapy is an important place to start. That what makes expressive arts therapy expressive arts therapy is its emphasis on multimodality and intermodality. So once more, with all due respect to the fields of dance therapy, art therapy, music therapy, poetry therapy, drama therapy, um, I'm a fan of anything that uses action when it comes to healing and transformation. And I think they're all fine fields. Yet for me, as somebody who's always been a very all of the above, never quite fits neatly into one category type of person, expressive arts is my perfect home because we do believe in employing that all of the above approach, mixing the modalities, using two or more modalities together in some kind of combination that we may call a process. Hence the title, Process Not Perfection. Uh, so what I'd like to do on the live cast is read the poem that appears in the introduction to Process Not Perfection. I wrote this poem at the beginning of 2017 as I was preparing the teaching curriculum that I began to share. And if you are in a 12-step recovery program, the whole phrase of progress, not perfection, might be well known to you. They, we talk a lot in 12-step world about it's, it's progress, not perfection. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great slogan. I don't doubt it that so much of our emphasis being on being perfect is what can cause us problems, that the pursuit of excellence is a good thing fundamentally speaking, but if we pursue perfection, we can really make ourselves quite neurotic. So uh, I decided to play with that slogan, progress, not perfection, because something expressive arts practice began to teach me is that it's all about process. Whether it's process the noun, combining two or more expressive arts practices together in order to have a transformative experience or process the verb. So that experience of working through something without a focus on outcome or analysis. So truly living one's life in process. So here's the poem that evolved. It, it came out like many things when I was on the road. Uh, I travel quite a bit. A lot of you know my, my life in that realm. And uh, yeah, so just Give the, the poem that was really the seedling that birthed the book a listen. In process. Works of art in gestation are often called works in progress. The slogans and inspirational cliches call for progress, not perfection. We judge students and employees with the metric of a progress report. What if we were to change every use of the word progress with the word process? What if works of art in gestation are called works in process? What if we encourage people to focus on process, not perfection? What if our metrics of evaluation took on the tone of a process report? What if we were to live our lives in process. All life could transform into a journey of art making fueled by the expressive spirit. We could refrain from judging ourselves so harshly and instead savor the unknown from the unknown. And yes, even from our mistakes, we can discover a new way of being from what we once labeled failures. We may unearth a new solution, a new way to solve a problem by creating in the moment and not forcing the big picture. May we encounter the essence of meaning. So when I channeled essentially that poem, I, I knew that the expressive arts book I wanted to write would be called Process Not Perfection because progress not perfection has long been one of my favorite recovery slogans and really deepening my own personal expressive arts process has helped me to just fall in love with this idea of living one's life in process. Hi, Ethan. I saw you just joined us. So, uh, yeah, that's where the title of the book came from. And I want to talk a little bit about 
um, how practicing expressive arts therapy has helped me to live my life in process and what that means for me. Uh, and then from there, I'll talk a little bit about how the book is structured. And yeah, for those of you who are hanging in and watching live, I would certainly welcome your questions or comments. So I'll talk to you about the book cover, this painting. I wrote a blog on it a few weeks ago or just last week that's posted in the Expressive Arts group if you are a part of that group and you may have read it. Uh, so this painting is, is very interesting to me because one of the things expressive arts therapy allows, you may have an expressive practice that you naturally gravitate towards. So for you, it could be writing. For another one of you, it may be dancing. You may have your favorite. So I would say dancing's probably traditionally been my favorite. Writing has certainly felt my more competent followed by music. And I never fancied myself much of a visual artist. I was never really good in art at school growing up. I couldn't draw a stick figure to save my life, let alone actual substantive things. And my very dear friend, Ellen DiCarlo, who was one of my roommates in college, was an art major. And I had the very beautiful experience our sophomore year watching her take painting as part of her art program and really dive into becoming just an amazing painter. And I was always so transfixed by her ability as an artist and loved her work. And I still have a lot of Ellen's pieces hanging in my house. And I, I kind of got this sense in my head that, you know, this is Ellen's talent, not mine. And I, I kid you not, for many years, it almost felt like I needed a special license to buy paint and a canvas in order to do that work. Like I just couldn't even begin to approach what it meant to paint. So I have liked collage over the years. That's probably the one visual medium I really did connect to uh, initially. And so whenever I, I had an opportunity to express myself visually, I usually went to collage because it never felt like there was much skill involved. It was just taking these disparate pieces and bringing them together into some kind of whole, which is, is very much what, what I kind of am as a person. So from that initial experience in collage, then I started working with Christine, my expressive arts teacher and mentor, uh, I, I got gutsier. Uh, Christine encouraged pastels uh, in addition to collage and some other visual forms on a retreat I was on with her. And I remember I got pastels at that point and just started being more exploratory in this practice of gush art, which is just kind of going with it. And where paint came to being, this is where I really do owe a lot of credit to my former husband, that uh, I was going through a pretty rough patch in the fall of 2016, and he bought me a paint by numbers kit, thinking, hey, maybe this visual thing will help because Jamie seems to like to be drawing a lot lately and all of that. And paint by numbers was a very interesting gateway for me to get into doing visual art, especially with, with painting, because I found it very nice to have a container, kind of similar to how adult coloring books might help you have that container to work in, but it helped me fall in love with paint and the texture, the sensation of moving a paintbrush along a canvas. And what I did was from that first paint by numbers, uh, I had a bunch of leftover paint and I let myself buy a canvas at that point. I was surprised at Michael's crafts where I go how inexpensive they were. And I let myself just use the leftover paint to create this canvas or to create a, a mandala type of thing on the canvas. And I liked it. It, it. it not only was visually appealing to me, but it helped me kind of just feel this sensual connection to painting. I really loved the experience of it, the color, the smell. And once again, that texture. So I continued with that pattern for the next couple months. I would do a paint by numbers, and then I would use the leftover paint to create something original. And then after a while, I let myself get paint in earnest and just continued with, with this process of exploring painting. So how this painting came to be was a total and complete accident, failure. Here's the story. Um, so this blue that you're seeing here around, uh, I was experimenting with a couple different new kinds of watercolor and some splash paint and spray paints and just trying to create a really, what I hoped was an interesting go with it type of background. And you may see in the design here that my initial intention was to draw one of those five pointed hands of Fatima, or you may know it as a hand of Hamsa. It was just speaking to me as the image that 
I was supposed to create. And I said, surely I can paint that. I can find something online to trace or to guide. And so I took a thin white paintbrush and started to paint that outline of the hand and everything was lopsided. The paint was chunky. I kind of went into some of these self-deprecating scripts a la, see, you can't even paint something that you can trace online. And you ruined this beautiful background that you created because I really did like kind of the, the play background that I came up with. So literally in frustration, I took a paper towel and just started kind of viciously wiping this botched hand of Fatima away to see if I could salvage the background in any way. And what emerged from that was this kind of white background of the flower. And it struck me as very interesting. And then all of these kind of spaces I ended up filling in with color, it was like the canvas just had grooves in it that were speaking to me. And I said, this kind of looks like a flower, what I'm doing. And so I went with the gold. Then I started putting the greenish hue in. And then finally, I just kind of followed the pattern the canvas left to go with the magenta. And this is the flower. And I stepped back from it kind of with this sense of, I made that. Like, I didn't set out to make that, but that's really cool. I just have loved it as a painting and I've had it hanging in my office ever since because I love the flower and what the flower represents and this idea of blooming and blossoming into a new growth and a new existence. And it just struck me immediately as I made this painting and continued to feel connected to it that if I ever did an expressive arts book, I wanted this to be the cover because that whole experience taught me so much about what it means to live one's life and process, to not be fixated on outcome, but to concern yourself rather with being in the moment and noticing what following the flow of the moment reveals. And it could be like in my case, what you initially think is your biggest mistake could be what one of the Hindu scriptures would call the seed of your highest good. Um, that in that mistake can emerge something that's beautiful uh, and useful and wonderful. And really, truly all of my engagement with expressive arts process and practice has been a journey in that, that it's had something to teach me. So how I ended up organizing this book, because um, the initial kind of practices or processes that I built were ones that I was teaching in trainings as part of our professional curriculum. And my initial idea when I started teaching expressive arts therapy professionally was I wanted to take a well-known clinical idea like grounding. So if you have been in therapy before you've or in recovery before, you've likely had a therapist work with you on the importance of grounding. If you are a therapist, you know that we talk so much with our clients about the importance of learning grounding skills to be able to bring themselves back to the here and now. Um, or to just orient to the here and now at the beginning of a session. So my hope was to take a skill like grounding and then build an expressive arts process around that skill. So remember a process in the form of a noun is a composition of two or more expressive arts practices. So my vision was to put together six practices into a single process. So for example, grounding ends up being the first process that we cover here in Process Not Perfection. Um, and I chose that for a reason because grounding is, a, is an imperative base skill if you're going to be doing deeper work, knowing that you are in the here and now and that if the work should overwhelm you, you always have this ability to bring yourself home to the here and now. So in the process of grounding, the first practice I use in the book is what's just a, a classic visualization because traditional classical visualizations can also be seen as part of expressive arts because you are using a lot of your imagination and composing those. Then uh, we go into tree pose, the yoga pose of tree pose. I, I guide readers through that. Then a dancing mindfulness inspired practice called moving the branches, uh, which is just that when you're from that base of tree pose, then getting a little bit more expressive. So there we're using movement but two different ways of, of using movement in this process. Then we go into something called gush art, which is basically free form, go with that type of art. Uh, then we go into a writing practice called take it to the page, and then a practice with rocks and objects called hold your ground, where you can either meditate on it or create the rock. Painting rocks has become a very big thing or writing on rocks. So you're a, I guide you through some possibilities uh, for using that. So, 
I have 15 processes, processes, however you're pronouncing it. I have 15 processes in this book, all of which can be viewed as their own self-contained retreat, if you wish to view it that way. Uh, because they're all built around a central theme and give you several practices you can try as part of that theme. So I chose 15 for a very deliberate reason. In that, the book is organized into three sections. In trauma-focused therapy, uh, trauma-informed therapy, and if you're a clinician who does a lot of work with trauma, you know this, that we generally talk about therapy being organized into three phases. Uh, what's essentially the stabilization phase, the processing or the going deeper phase, and then reintegration. Sometimes it's called reintegration into the, into society. But it's basically this idea that after you have achieved a period of initial healing and growth, life will still happen. And you have to use a lot of skills that you have gained in your therapeutic process to help you move those skills into life. So my thought was to take the three main phases of this consensus model of trauma treatment and build expressive arts processes for each of those phases. And if you've studied dancing mindfulness or read the book, you know that that beginning, middle, and end idea of the three phases really dictates how I built dancing mindfulness as well. Um, whether you're doing a five or 10 minute dancing mindfulness practice or a full hour and a half, hour, 15 minute class, I want facilitators to structure classes in a way that classes will have a beginning, middle, end, and end. Because um, I really do think it allows for the greatest sense of safety for people to explore, to be able to get their toes wet first, metaphorically speaking, and assess if they feel safe enough to go in for maybe some of the deeper, more emotionally challenging processes uh, or, or parts of the practice in the case of dancing mindfulness. So in the book, I have five processes that work with the section I call preparing, which is most connected to the stabilization phase in the three phase model. And preparing is very, very much connected to this idea of not just grounding, but getting the skills you need for the journey ahead. So grounding is the first process. Breathing is the second process. Distress tolerance is the third process. Uh, it's a very DBT style term, which basically means, hey, life is going to keep coming at you. Do you have the skills to deal with what might come up? So I build an expressive arts process with five or six practices around um, the stress tolerance. And then we go into the skill of mindfulness and the skill of self-compassion. So those are the four main kind of clinical skills around which I build expressive arts processes in the first section. Then for the second section, which I call deepening, uh, it has a connection to the trauma-focused um, phase of kind of in EMDR, we'd say reprocessing, but some people would refer to it as simply processing or just doing the work going deeper. So the processes that I have built into the second section are embodiment, this idea of exploring the edge, looking at your blocks to feeling, playing with the idea of living outside the box, and then embracing the story. Uh, so that's the second section. And then in the third section, which I call manifesting, it's now that you've hopefully worked through these first two sessions and have done a piece of work either in your own experience or with the guidance of a professional or a friend or a study group that you're able to take what you have learned and carry it more into life and bringing your goals and intentions, dreams, whatever they may be, into greater fruition. So the processes in the third section are adaptability and flexibility, nourishment, uh, daily practice beyond self-care because self-care is one of the great cliches right in the helping profession so don't get me wrong I'm all about self-care but this really speaks to the idea that self-care has to be a daily commitment and not just something you do as an event and part of what can help you stay committed to that daily commitment is to practice and you can certainly use expressive arts as part of that practice uh, then the final uh, process is called claiming the creative voice. So something I want to speak to there is a reason I like the term expressive arts therapy more so than creative arts therapy. And the term creative arts therapy isn't bad because <clears throat> it's actually a licensed profession in some states. Uh, but a lot of my clients I've worked with over the years get hung up on the word creative. 
I hear so often, I'm not a very creative person. And where a lot of us have equated creative in our mind is this idea that we have to be producing some kind of original output in order to be a creative person. And that's just not the case. That uh, you can do cover music, using a classic example, but your version of that song has never been created into existence before. And so, yeah, I mean, some people may be labeled as especially creative because they are original and their thinking is really outside the box. But the reality is we're all creative. The process of making something makes you creative. That's a line that I use in the book. Yet a good gateway to being able to claim your creativity is to know that we all have the power to express something. That even if you're giving yourself a bellowing primal scream at the top of your lungs, that is an expression. Whether you're scribbling fiercely on a, on a piece of paper, that's an expression. So most people I work with can own that they have something to express. And then from there, people can sometimes end up more fully claiming themselves as a creative, but we usually have to claim ourselves as having a birthright to express first. So a little bit more about the audience for the book. I already mentioned that I did write it for the general public and I put all the proper cautions in the introduction about working the processes in order, about how to opt out, how to keep yourself as safe as possible when you work through the processes, uh, because these can bring up some emotional charge. And I haven't done anything in here that I feel is irresponsible as a therapist having out there in the general public. Um, yet the reality is a lot of folks cannot access therapy or cannot access the kind of therapy that I wish everybody could have, which is this more embodied experiential mode of healing. So you know, self-help books, mutual help books are certainly no big thing. So if people want to view what I've done here as more of a self-help volume, they certainly can. But I do see it as being a companion to what somebody may be doing in psychotherapy because all of the material in here is clinically sound, based on clinically sound ideas that we work with quite frequently, especially in the realm of trauma-informed, trauma-focused care. So my hope is people who are in therapy can possibly take this book and use it as a supplement to what they're getting. And I also have the caution in the introduction that run that by your therapist. It doesn't have to be something that you do as a rogue move. Because um, I certainly see what I have done here in this book, Process Not Perfection, as being complementary to, to any path of therapy. And that's really... Uh, a way to look at the expressive arts in general, that it's a complementary path to so many different modalities that are out there for healing. And I also find this book to be useful. Like, let's say you have gone through your major course of trauma therapy, and it's been years, and you haven't really found a good fit of therapist, or you're not sure if maybe you've moved or you've moved on from the therapist you were with, but you're still feeling a call on your heart to do some deeper work on some issues, uh, guided expressive arts processes can take you to that kind of next level of work that you may need to do uh, kind of beyond therapy or beyond treatment. So that's where you may find a usefulness and a utility in this volume. So it's robust. It's thick. It came out a lot bigger than I even thought it would because uh, we are dealing with over 100 practices here. If you think 15 processes uh, at six to seven practices each, there's some bonus practices that I've given as options. So some of the processes even have eight practices. So you're dealing with over 100 practices in here, different variations. Uh, I just did an interview last week where I mentioned that uh, these processes can also be good guidance for group. So whether you're doing a clinical mental health or addiction group, whether you're doing more of a book club type of group, um, as long as you're within the scope of practice of what that group is about, uh, these expressive arts processes can give you a good theme on which to guide the structure of your group. And I want to share with you one other really fun potential application of this of this book. So I mentioned in the book, my hope is you can still engage in these practices without having to spend a lot of money. That many of the practices in here you can do with 
just the materials that are hanging around your house, especially if you have implements for creativity. Uh, Edward Carson, who is one of our contributors to the book, is a good friend of mine who submitted two of his visual pieces. Uh, most of the challenge he gives for himself when he creates mixed media is to only use things that are hanging around his house. And occasionally he'll supplement with buying different supplies, but I really like that. Like he uses mailers and scraps that he finds and, and just creates these, these very, very beautiful pieces. So there's a lot of blank space to be had because I really wanted things not to feel crammed together. So for example, this is our section divider, section three on manifesting. And something that I find pretty exciting about all that white space is you can do a lot of your creating, expressing, drawing, writing things out right here in the book. You, you Certainly you could keep a journal, a writing journal, a visual journal, canvases, however you're led. Um, but there's a lot of cool opportunities here to just mark this up. Uh, so I want to give a proper shout out to Michelle Tompkins, who's a member of our Dancing Mindfulness community, graduate of Institute for Creative Mindfulness's EMDR program. She was a graphic designer in a previous life before becoming a therapist, and she lent her design skills to the the uh, this book and bringing this book in, into vision. So for example, the title page here, Process Not Perfection, is her own creation, and uh, and I discovered last night, it's actually a really cool coloring page. We have some coloring pages in here connected to one of the practices, but mark this book up. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the practice of visual journaling, it's something that Michelle really introduced very directly into our dancing mindfulness community. If you've practiced art therapy or other forms before, you may know of visual journaling more as altered books and working with this idea of taking a book and transforming it. So. Last week or two, I got the review copy, uh, which is pretty typical when you write a book, that you get uh, an actual proof of the book to look through before signing off and approving it. And Erin Kelly, who is one of my good friends, also a member of the Dancing Mindfulness ICM community, uh, she was one of the proofreaders on the book. She said, why don't you visual journal the proof of the book? So for instance, last night I took the title page and I just went to town kind of coloring it with this proof. So it's up to you. If you're the type to mark up a book, take your copy of Process Not Perfection and mark it up. So yeah, a lot of what, what you can do with altering books is just having a fun time transforming them. And this is one of the pieces that I, it's in process, like many things in my creative process. Um, yeah, so if you're compelled to, um, do your expressions right in the book itself. I will tell you as the author, I will not take offense. So to circle back to a comment I made at the beginning of this live cast, because I know some different folks are on it right now. One of the reasons this book means the world to me, and I would even go as far as to say this is probably the most precious book I've ever written. Um, and one of those reasons is it is, subjectively speaking, a very affordably priced book compared to a lot of the expressive arts material out there that's written more for a textbook audience. So I wanted to put out a book that was accessible to the public. Um, it is produced by my company, Institute for Creative Mindfulness. Um, a little story, I did have a last minute offer to get it published elsewhere, but it just felt like the right move to keep it forward as an ICM project because this book is very ICM. It's very Institute for Creative Mindfulness. It reflects a lot of our own voices of people who've come through Institute for Creative Mindfulness programs. And I really see it being as a manual and a guide for years forward uh, for our expressive arts curriculum and doing other programs that we do. But it's also something that those of you in the public can hopefully access as well, particularly if you can't join us for a live program or a live retreat. Uh, yeah, there's about 25 people who contributed when I was uh, wrote the or really put together uh, the most solid core of the book last summer. I invited in my social media groups and in my social networks people to either give feedback or to work through some of the processes. And if they wanted to have their work shared in the book, I would certainly do that with properly attributing them. And yeah, some of my dear friends and some people I don't know very well uh, put work forth to, to en enhance the volume. I share that 
I don't have these pieces in here to feel you have to emulate them in any way because this is your original expression, how you're going to respond to these processes and practices. But these pieces are in here to hopefully give you a little bit of inspiration, especially if you may be finding yourself stuck. And these pieces are in here to really show that expressive arts is a community practice really at its heart, that you may work through it individually and that's great. Yet there's so many implications and opportunities for bringing about healing in our communities and in our world entire when we can create and express together and share. And it just delights my heart that there's so many contributions in here that just breathe a life into the work that I couldn't have done if I just put this out as a series of my own processes and practices. So uh, I have done all of these practices that are in here. I'm a very big believer in practicing what I preach and I do not do any, oops, make sure I'm still on. Uh, I do not share anything that I haven't done myself. So uh, it's been my privilege in putting this book together to be able to share with you a lot of the soul work of my heart and how expressive arts has helped me to move forward. And the one last point I want to make, and please, if you're still on the live cast, send any questions or comments that you may have my way. Um, I will also put a link for the, the, the Amazon link for the book here in the comments before, um, before we're done. Um, uh, Adelina, I see you commented. Thank you. And, uh, Stephanie, happy tears. Oh, that makes me very, that makes me very happy. Um, another reason I really like expressive arts as a field is this idea that the expressive arts are for everyone, because even in the structure of professional expressive arts world, as governed by IATA, who I mentioned already, there are two credentials that are offered. There's the expressive arts therapist credential that people like myself are eligible to get because we are clinicians. But then there's also a credential they offer called expressive arts consultant and educator. And so my mentor, Christine Paintner, who I mentioned, that is her credential. She is a PhD in the pastoral arts. She's a PhD in Christian spirituality, has worked primarily as a spiritual director, religious ed director and brings the expressive arts into that work. She now leads pilgrimages. I've been on one and actually um, brings the expressive arts into, into that world. So there are so many professions where the expressive arts can be folded in. Uh, even in the dancing mindfulness training program, we've trained classroom teachers, we've trained nurses, we've trained obviously all different brands of clinician, yoga teachers, professional dancers, um, and Every year I get a new person from a new professional background who will send me a message saying, do you think I can use this work in what I do? And it always makes sense. Because uh, wouldn't it be great if we can approach so many more of our professions and ways of doing life with this zest for being in process and this zest for bringing a more creative, soulful, colorful, movement-based way of being into how we operate in the world. So as I wrap up here in the final minutes of this live cast, again, if you have any other comments or questions, please feel free to send them through. Uh, I will post the Amazon link uh, for where you can get the book. Um, if you're a Facebooker and you have not yet already, there is a group that I have called the Dancing Mindfulness and Expressive Arts Community Forum. I don't think there's a the, it's just Dancing Mindfulness and Expressive Arts Community Forum. And that group is a place where you can share your ideas. You can ask your questions. I'm very active personally in that group. And if you're working through the material in process, not perfection, you're more than welcome to share your work with us. Um, Additionally, the Dancing Mindfulness website, dancingmindfulness.com, uh, we keep an expressive arts therapy blog there. And it's been open submissions for the last four or five years. And yes, we would love to have you submit your work to that blog. So you could just send me a message on Facebook if you have a piece you want to pitch for that blog, whether it's directly related to your work in, in Process Not Perfection or just some other work you want to share with the wider world, um, we'd happily give you an internet vehicle for doing that. Because so much of what drives me is this idea of sharing with community what 
we create and express. Allison, thank you for your lovely comment and for joining. Adelina, save me a copy. Sign from you. I'll be in the summer. Great. Let me know when you're here. I'll mail it to you in the U.S. Uh, if you do want a signed copy, I have to ask Mary, my COO, if she set up a link yet for um we are going to have a page on www.instituteforcreativemindfulness.com which is the best way you can learn about me and the education i offer uh where you can get a signed copy of the book we we can send it directly to you with a personalized signature from me so i already mentioned uh, institute for creative mindfulness.com which is my more technical website of my institute of our programs TraumaMadeSimple.com is another web resource to make you available or to make available to you. I reference it several times in the book because that's where I have all my videos and articles. Basically, everything I've done for free online is in the is cataloged in TraumaMadeSimple.com. So I really have set that up as a resources site for for the general community, and I have a professional website too, JamieMarriage.com. Although if you go to any one of them, you'll link to, to several of the others. So this live cast will replay. I'll post it on several of the professional pages. And I thank you for those of you who were able to join us live. And if you liked this chat about PNP, as we're calling it for short, please feel free to share it with others. So have a good evening, good morning, wherever you may be in the world. And I hope that you can express something today.